Parasite. Is it a reboot? No. Are the Avengers in it? No. Well then. I don't know what Parasite is. I don't give a shit. Hi, I'm Max the Janitor. My videos have this strange habit of going off the rails and everything I write in the original script doesn't even end up on the channel. So I'm going to spell out what this video is about for the intro. Not for you, but for myself. Otherwise, I'll end up trying to compare this movie to Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Actually, that's not a bad idea. They both have the running theme that you don't have to be qualified to be good at something. And Americans think John Cho was in both movies. Here's the outline for this video. Spoilers from this point forward. Why does the beach ball on the poster look like the Google Chrome logo? Explaining what a parasite is. Who is the parasite? What I thought of the movie. Did it really deserve best picture? I need to include a disclaimer here. All the information I presented is what I've gathered through only a few days of research. It definitely will not cover everything because this movie is so packed full of meaning and the meaning I do assign isn't the only interpretation. And there's things like the rain scene or why the dad killed the other dad I won't even cover because it's already been covered by YouTubers who are a lot more competent than I am. Why does it look like the Google logo is on the movie poster of Parasite? And I think the answer is one of two options. Number one, it was a coincidence. The beach ball was only placed there because it has bright colors, which is very contrasting to the rest of the poster. The beach ball is supposed to represent leisure and fun and how being rich is a fun way to live life. That is why the Park family is sitting right next to the beach ball, while Mr. Kim, who represents the lower class, is standing closer to a cold, dead body that represents pain, death, and darkness. Kiwu is holding the scholar stone while he's crossing the line from the inside to the outside, possibly representing how he wants to rely on the stone to cross the line into the upper class and into the light. The black bars are used on the criminals of the movie, while the white bars are used on the victims. I'm going on a leap here, but DeSong is the only one inside, and he kind of looks like a ghost. This could represent the ghost DeSong thought he saw which traumatized him. The ghost actually being this man, who lives in their bunker, which is just a metaphor for North Korea, as he has cut himself off from the rest of the world. Option number two. Alright, put on your tinfoil hats for this one. Bong purposely made the beach ball look similar to the Google logo. The beach ball represents being rich, but Bong also subliminally used shapes and colors to attract your attention to a specific part of the poster so Americans would identify one of the most popular logos in the world on a South Korean movie poster. We associate Google with power, results, needs, money, influence. If you could take those things and apply it visually to his poster, then Bong has already begun to cross the line that is the language barrier and explain what his movie is about to a Western audience without ever saying a word. Of course, in South Korea, they don't even use Google, so I could really be stretching here, but you have to admit this looks way too close to be coincidental, but I guess we'll never know. The opening shot does a great job of explaining how poor this family is. They are literally lower in the ground than the toilet they shit in. Living semi-underground is common for some South Korean families. In 2015, it was estimated almost 2% of the population was living in these semi-basement residents. They were originally built in the 1970s for potential North Korean attacks, but were later modified as to meet the demand for lower income housing needs. When talking about the Kim family home, the film's director Bong Joon-ho said there's always that fear if you sink any lower, you may go completely underground, which is exactly where the father of the Kim family, Ki Tech, ends up. The tour of the Kim family home begins and ends within a few seconds. Compared to the Park family home, which is so large, we don't even see the master bedroom until an hour and 42 minutes into the movie. In fact, I'm not even sure we ever get a full tour of the house. It's so large, the Park family is entirely unaware of the bunker inside their own home. These basement dwellings are the last place you want to end up living in, and usually not the first place a family does live in. Often families have to move into one after losing their previous home. We can see the Kim family still has some of their belongings like books tied together, almost as if they were transporting it recently. We also see the closet space is packed to the brim like they once had room for the possessions but no longer do. Bong wanted the Kim family financial situation to come off as not completely their own fault, but to actually reflect the current state of South Korea in regards to unemployment. Bong purposely makes the Kims a competent family. The dad is a good driver, the son and daughter are skilled tutors, the mom is a good housekeeper, and she was even skilled enough at one point to be a competitive athlete. Yet they are so poor and desperate for work they have to con their way into it. They are not scamming the family out of money, they just take an immoral path to being at their service. When Min, the wealthy college-age friend, shows up on the son's doorstep with a scholar stone, Mr. Kim instantly recognizes it, indicating that at one point he was around wealth enough to be familiar with these expensive stones. Bong explains, is it still a symbol if the character outright tells you that it is? What does that mean? <laughs> Bong chooses not to be so blunt and hits you over the head with the meaning of the scholar stone. Instead, you have to dig for the meaning behind it. Bong has been purposely evasive when asked what the Scholar Stone symbolizes, and the more I dig into it, the more complicated it seems. Ki Woo falls under the belief that the stone will bring about better financial times like Min stated, and it appears to immediately start working. To him, it is a metaphor for a wealthier life. 
Kiwu puts too much faith in the stone to lift him out of poverty because at the end of the day, it is just a rock. Not something that will help you get wealthy, just a solid mass that can be used as a deadly weapon. He's literally beaten over the head with the metaphor. The rock was supposed to represent material wealth, but all it did was represent dreams of material wealth. And when it's used to bash Kiwu over the head, it gives him brain damage. After this brain damage, the movie ends with Kiwu's dreams of being wealthy. The rock quite literally gives him dreams of material wealth, but it never really gives him the wealth he's searching for. I saw a Screen Rant article about how the Scholar Stone was actually hollow because it was floating, and I'm telling you right now that it's not true. They even comment in the beginning how heavy the stone is. Does this sound hollow to you? As for it floating, the stone is not floating literally. Bong even stated in an interview that it was an artistic choice to show that Kiwu felt the stone was drawn to him. <laughs> Just like the scene where Mrs. Park is talking about the song's trauma and the cake appears on the floor. The rock also symbolizes the family's journey. When it is presented to them, it is on a nice stand, and the family situation begins to look up when Kiwu has a plan to become a tutor and eventually go to college. Oh, After he receives the stone, the doorway to the path to success literally opens in front of him. But almost right away, it seems the family doesn't actually understand the stone. You see the mom scrubbing the stone with a brush. The value in these stones come from the fact that every edge has been sculpted by nature. By scrubbing away what nature did, you take away what made the rock special in the first place. When the rock finds itself submerged in sewage water in the Kim family home, and then in the gymnasium surrounded by people in the lower class, Kiwu finds out what his dad actually thinks of plans. At this point, the stone has lost its stand. It has been scrubbed and it's been submerged in sewage water. Yet Kiwu still clings to the stone, just like the Kim family still clinging to the idea that they can climb the social class ladder despite all the bad shit that is happening around them. Something that might not be immediately recognizable to a Western audience is when Key Tech talks about betraying his country. He's most likely referencing the five Yulsa traders, five Korean officials who helped facilitate Korea being controlled by Imperial Japan with a treaty signed in 1905. These men are still heavily scrutinized in Korea for selling out their country, and the effects of this treaty are still felt in Korea today. When Korea regained their independence after World War II, one of the traitors' graves was unearthed, and his dead body was literally ripped apart. Yet when these men were actually alive, they were heavily rewarded by Japan for helping them take over Korea. They lived rich lives and were all promoted up the ladder until the time of their death. Kitek is trying to say if you betray your country, it doesn't matter, as long as it benefits you. If you kill someone, it doesn't matter, as long as it benefits you. This is most likely Kitek trying to convince himself what he must do for his family to succeed. He's convincing himself to kill the basement dwelling family. Yet what he accidentally ends up doing is convincing Ki Wu to do it. The rock receives the most aggressive damage when Ki Wu drops it down the bunker stairs. What was supposed to be a symbol of knowledge displayed by Confucian scholars has now been scrubbed, drowned in shit, and heavily damaged. It's then used quite literally as a murder weapon against Ki Wu in the climax of the movie, as the house of cards the Kim family built comes crumbling down. Despite my over analysis of the Scholar Stone, I honestly feel I've only brisked the surface of what the stone truly means to Parasite. Maybe it was a metaphor for how shortcuts to wealth are dangerous. Maybe it was a symbol that expensive items like these have lost all their actual meaning. Maybe it's just a rock, and Bong put it in the movie just to mess with our heads. The song's fascination with the Indians is an example of real-life cultural appropriation. Native Americans have a rich and deep culture that was stomped out with the legal genocide that occurred in the United States. But to the Park family, it is boiled down to something trendy kids can use while playing make-believe, like being an astronaut or a superhero. Bong said in an interview, For the son and mother, they're just fancy decorations, very surface-level decorations. They wear cheap headdresses and use plastic toy imitations bought off Amazon. But Americans' culture appropriation of the Native Americans is so common, this theme probably wasn't even picked up by most Western audiences. Three women are gathered, one rich, one poor, one so poor her husband lives underground for a debt that can never be repaid. The two poor people fight for the attention of the rich woman, with the poorest woman being dismissed. The moment Ki Jung says she studied art and psychology, the lights turn off. This could signify Ki Jung is crossing the line from light into darkness as she lies to Mrs. Park. She is also doing everything she can to keep herself and her family from descending any lower into poverty, even if it means she must cross the line. 
This happens quite literally as the camera switches over the shoulder of Ki Jong, showing that she has crossed the line. Working at a virtual reality company is a great metaphor for Mr. Park refusing to actually see the real world around him, instead of living only in the world he has built for himself. We see the Park family actually needs the Kim family as well. It's not only one family being a parasite off the other. The Park family cannot function at their capacity without outside help from the Kim family. Just like the Kim family relies on the Park family for money, the Park family needs the lower class families to do their dirty work. The answer to who is the parasite in this movie is more complicated than just being one person. Everyone is leeching off someone else in some way or another, whether it's for financial gain, for outside help, or for food. When we look at the movie literally, the parasite is the poor man in the basement. He contributes nothing and just leeches off everyone else. But I think the message Bong was really trying to get across in this movie is the derogatory definition for parasite. A person who habitually relies on or exploits others. Mr. Park has everything done for him. The parenting, the driving, the cooking, the teaching. He uses people and gives them the bare minimum to keep them afloat all while he just keeps piling up his wealth and status. That doesn't mean Mr. Park is a bad man. He's just blind to the class struggle beneath him. For example, when the family walks up to the stairs, they just assume the lights were automatic. But the poor class is actually responsible for keeping it running. And what keeps them running is a belief that if they work hard enough, one day they'll be rich too. But a system where the rich exploit the poor and the poor fight amongst themselves is actually a broken system. Mr. Park pokes fun at his eldest daughter, him and his son share a laugh at her expense. This is one of the only times in the movie where Mr. Park directly talks to his daughter and he says her lips look like a duck bill. This could be a metaphor for how much South Korean families place emphasis on having a son. Mr. Park spoils his son and the two have a very deep father-son bond. Yet Mr. Park pays no attention to his eldest daughter. Traditionally, Korea society was set up so the sons always inherited the wealth and the property in the family name. The laws have changed, so now daughters can inherit just as much as sons can, but South Korean women still have it very difficult. Women are pressured to constantly strive towards unattainable standards of beauty. They are not promoted in the workplace in the same way a man would be, and public harassment of South Korean women in the streets is still common. The Park family never looks down. They don't check under their bed, under the table. They don't look at the floor in the basement, despite their most likely being track marks from the door to their hidden bunker. They are literally blind to the class struggle beneath them. So blind it kills Mr. Park. I want you guys to watch a scene in this movie, and I want you to know I didn't edit this scene at all. As Moon Gwang throws up, shit literally flies out of the toilet at Ki Jung. Now this poop specifically gets flung at Ki Jung's face, and Ki Jung was the only one from the Kim family that gets murdered. In any other movie, I would say this is a coincidence, but with this movie, you can't be sure. You see, poop in the face is a metaphor for murder. There's something about Ki Jung being the one that dies that I think needs to be explored. Everyone's asking why did the dad kill the other dad, so I think that has distracted everyone from asking why Ki Jung is the one in the Kim family who dies. And I think we have to go back to Ki Jung's job. She's the only one who created the job for herself instead of replacing someone else. Earlier in the movie, they state that they live in a country where 500 people will apply for a security job position. So creating a successful position for yourself breaks the mold of what the Kim family views as work. She is also the smartest and most skilled person in the family. Her Photoshop skills and her ability to learn art therapy in one night emphasize how smart she really is. But there is one aspect of Ki Jung's personality that went over all Western audiences' heads, and it wasn't until I dug deeper that I was able to find new meaning in Parasite. Something that subtitles can't translate for the film is how formally, casually, or even derogatory they talk to each other. When Ki Jung crosses the line, she goes from speaking formally to casually to Mrs. Park. It's the equivalent of going from yes sir to right away bro. I mean, you wouldn't say right away bro to your boss, right? Mrs. Park is much older than Ki Jung and she's also her employer, yet Ki Jung talks to her like they are close friends. Mrs. Park accepts this crossing of the line and goes as far to try to impress Ki Jung with constantly showing off her English. You know what I mean? <laughs> Ki Jung created her own job. She was good at it. She was accepted by the Park family. Even her own family admitted that she actually fit in. <laughs> She was the only one to actually cross the line, and Bong killed her as a metaphor for saying that society doesn't want that. Society wants to keep the poor poor and the rich rich.
The shot reverse shot is done another time in the movie during the final act, but this time Mr. Kim is once again unable to cross the line. He annoys Mr. Park for a second time with a conversation about his love for his wife. <laughs> <laughs> he says we'll call it love, and Mr. Kim holds on to that and brings it up again, almost like he wants confirmation about something. I think what he wanted to know was if he actually had something on Mr. Park. He wanted to find a reason not to envy him. Even in their darkest moments, the Kim still loved each other. We see that as Mr. Kim grabs her medal during the flood. Love was also something that the poorest family had as well. It seemed to me that the only person Mr. Park really loved was his son, someone to pass his legacy on to. Parasite is a movie so jam-packed full of meaning it makes Knives Out look like Cop Out. It's a masterpiece. I have no idea what's going on inside Bong Joon-ho's head, but it must just be exploding with ideas 24-7. Literally every shot, prop, location, and word spoken in Parasite has several different meanings, somehow all connecting to each other without ever stepping on itself or falling down in the process. There's a slow building tension in the movie that shocks you awake during the middle without ever leaving the real world. This movie is a 10 out of 10. Parasite didn't win Best Picture because the Oscars went woke. This isn't the same thing as the Academy pretending like Black Panther was good. Parasite has a message that everyone in the world can relate to on some level. It's so complex, trying to review it physically hurts my brain. My favorite family, the one I feel for the most, is the Kims. I mean, who would you rather spend a day with, this family or this family? <laughs> Parasite wholeheartedly deserved best picture, so we could hear the only good acceptance speech of the night. Thank you. I, I will drink until next morning. Thank you. Uh. Thanks for tuning in, Janitor Squad. I want to thank my patrons. Thank you to the two guys in my Jared Leto Joker tier, Nikolai and Dakota, and thank you to my Nicholas Cage Treasure Hunters, Jake and Caleb. We're gonna do an end credits disclaimer on this video. Uh, last time I did a Joker review like this, I was getting comments like, Jared Leto is the best Joker, kill yourself. And I was like, maybe. I mean, I do believe in reincarnation. Maybe it could come back as a waiter instead. The internet's waiter. I don't know if that's got the same ring to it. But anyway, if you don't like it, I don't know, I don't really blame you. But if you do like it, consider joining my Patreon. I'm gonna go gain 10 pounds this winter, so my dog food bill's getting pretty high. See you next time, Janitor Squad.